Hey guys, Pastor Ryan Hurt here at LBC. I'm so excited that you've tuned in to listen to this message. But before we begin, I would ask that if you've been blessed by LBC or these sermons, that you might consider giving back to us so that we can continue to put out these resources to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, both here in Lingaville and the world abroad. You can give on this app or website. As happy as that we are that you have tuned in, we do ask that this does not take the place of being a part of the local church, and we encourage all folks to be a part of the local body. We are gl glad to provide this sermon for you, and I pray that this message helps you and you're growing in Jesus Christ. Blessings. All right, how is everybody? That 28-second bumper video don't give us a lot of time to get situated here. Um, man, a lot to get to in a little bit of time, and so um, I want to jump right into this, but I want to set up because uh, we got a lot of people that's always here that are first-time guests, and um, we've just been in the sermon series. We've been trying to do things a little different through here, and we've been putting stuff on the table. Here's what the scriptures um, are leading us to to get through these difficult moments and these difficult seasons of life, and, and then we transition from these moments into just real-life stories of how the, um, this can be applicable to all of us, because it's easy for me to get up here and a preacher and go, well, the tree falls on your road, then give it to Jesus and keep your eyes on him, and that's all good and well, but it comes from a different place when it's just, it's just normal people that aren't preachers um, to be able to come in here and go, this is how the Lord has used worship um, in my story. And so um, it's just been a, a hope and a prayer that it would ultimately transition us as a church into this, um, this sanctification. We, it's a big churchy word for that we're growing in the Lord and that we would understand that when that phone call comes, um, when the rug gets pulled out from underneath you, not if, but when, when that happens, that we'll have practical things in our tool belt, um, more than emotions, more than feelings, more than Sunday morning Christianity, and then we can get to this place and go, man, I remember when we went through the sermon series um, and, and I remember the power of worship or I remember the, 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 the power of, of praying and fasting. And so the end goal is that, is that, that it would help just sanctify us as a body um, when those phone calls come, when the bad days come, um, man, we can still uh, keep enduring through our faith. And so last week I said that the next few weeks um, we're going to be in like four big story arcs. So we're going to land the plane on this prayerfully on November the 2nd, the Sunday before election day. That last Sunday, we're going to spend just praying um, and fasting for our nation and um, praying and fasting for um, our communities, our marriages, just a lot of stuff going on. I'm so excited about that. But there's a lot of information leading up to that. And so we tried to, to narrow it down into four big arcs. Um, the holiness of God we've been talking about over the, the course of several weeks, understanding that that as we approach these trees in our road, um, we are praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a galaxy-speaking God, not a fat guy on a cloud playing the harp, like just this understanding of who God is, that he's holy, 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 right? That was arc number one. Um, arc number two is, is the power of worship. Uh, we spent last week talking about it, going to spend a little more time today talking about it. Um, arc number three was when what we see and what we feel transcends what we know to be true, right? These moments that we're going to look at next week, like Gideon, where, where the Lord calls you out to something and, and you feel like you're facing an army of thousands and, and God's going, I need you to defeat the entire army. Um, things that we see and feel go hand, I mean, go opposite of what we know to be true. We know God's going to be faithful in that, but how is he going to be faithful? Um, and, and then that last arc is the power of prayer and fasting. Uh, fasting is just something we don't talk a lot about in the church. Um, and I think if we can get into this place of doing it not just out of begrudge and submission, but understanding that it's in the Bible for a reason, um, we're going to see um, just really cool things come from that. But I'm just excited to continue this, this discussion that we started last week of uh, the power of worship um, and excited uh, for this group that's up here today. But it was uh, spring of 2009. Uh, the best that I can remember. Um, Garrett was a little bitty baby, like just a couple of months old. Brody was a little bitty, like terrible twos, little bitty. And then Kendall was little. Kinley was a, it was just one of those seasons of life that was, was extremely difficult. Some of you guys are in those seasons of life right now uh, where you hadn't been a drinker, but you think about it some days, right? Um, you never wanted to smoke cigarettes, but there's just days like, man, I could just go smoke a cigarette on the porch because I'm just losing my mind. Like we went through a season like that in 2009 where we had little babies everywhere, diapers everywhere, um, no intimacy, nothing. I mean, it's just like you're just making ends meet, right? You're working all the time. You're just paying bills. You're trying to keep the, the, the red from being on your bank statement, right? You're just doing what you know to do, and you're just in the, the trenches. And a lot of you guys are there. And I'm going to tell you what my mama told me in all those seasons of life. 
this too shall pass. She told me that all the time, and I wanted to punch her every time she said that, because I'm like, Mom, you don't understand. I got a diaper genie full of diapers in here. My house smells like poop. Like, this is not going to pass, but it does, and it, and it passes real quickly. But at that time, we didn't see it. And there was a moment in 2009 where I sat at the piano because I was just frustrated, and that's what I still do when I'm frustrated is I just sat at the piano, and I started playing uh, that old Cast and Crown song, uh, Word of God Speak. Um, and I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. And I got that line out, and I, I hit that on the piano. And I heard Melissa scooch out of our bedroom and across the living room floor. She was also had postpartum. I mean, it was just a bad time. And, and she got behind me. It was one of the most sacred memories of my marriage. Um, she put her head on the back of me, and we just both began to cry. And I couldn't even get through the song. I was trying to sing it um, over us. But, but it was in that moment that I realized I was a worship leader at the time, but in that moment, in that little snapshot, I wasn't a worship leader. Um, it wasn't about the song that I was singing. It wasn't about a genre. It wasn't a worship time at church. Um, it was just this real vulnerable time to go, God, we need you. Uh, we need you to speak to us because these are the difficultest of our days, and we need you to speak to us. And and it was in that moment that it really would be able to transform my whole view on what worship is and what worship is not. I love music, always have loved music, but there's just something different about worship. Um, and, and it was in that moment that I really began to see it in a different lens. And this has been the heart behind this arc and looking at this power of worship. What is worship and what is not worship? Because if the enemy has done something very successful He's used worship to be the very spearhead of division within the church. Um, not only division within the church, but what we're seeing even more dangerously in the Western world church is he's using worship to divide even our gatherings on a Sunday morning. And we know this to be true because when you think about church, there's worship and then there's the word. You know what I'm talking about? And, and we're either on both sides of the fence, on one side of the fence of that. Um, so you either, maybe you come in here and it's like, man, I just love listening to Haley and Kami sing. But when Ryan gets up there, I'm just sleeping the whole sermon. And I see y'all for the record. Um, and so maybe you're here, like you're in that place. Like, I just want, I just love the music. They sing in my favorite songs and that's awesome. Um, but some of y'all are here like, I don't like the music. It's too loud. I don't like rock and roll stuff. I just want to come hear the word. And the danger of that is that we've taken the very things that should coexist in the sermon together and we've made it two different sermons or we made it two different um, things in, um, in our gatherings. And so I saw this even last summer at a youth camp. We were at youth camp and this happens everywhere. This wasn't no knock on the youth camp or our kids or anything, but worship started. All the kids bum rushed the stage and they're jumping up and down and one year they're throwing water on everybody. I mean, it was awesome. I and mean, we were jumping up and down. Even Richard was jumping up and down. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Like we worship in the Lord and, and again, no knock on that. Um, but, but it would get five, six songs into this deal. Um, the worship leader prays. Preacher comes out with the Bible, sets it on the podium, and everybody scatters like ants back to their seats. They go back to their seats. They're all talking. It takes three or four minutes to rein everybody in because now it's time for the word. Um, and, and it just it saddened me. I just remember I went back to the cabin, and I, and I told Richard and Kelly and the youth leaders, I said, it's sad that the enemy has been so successful in taking the very thing that should prepare our hearts for what the word is going to speak into us and we've made it two separate things um, and I think even more dangerously we made it about the music and we made it about the songs and we made it about the dude in skinny jeans that's singing all the songs rather than seeing again that God has given us worship to coexist with the word and we're going to talk about that here um, in a moment and so this has been my heart behind this whole arc is that, that we would see worship more than a song we would see it more than a melody we'd see it more than a hymn versus contemporary Christian music um, but that we'd see it in the light of King Jehoshaphat, that it was a weapon that he used against an army, that we'd see it in the light of Joshua, that it was a battle cry as he marched around Jericho and shout a song of praise, um, that we'd see it like Nehemiah to go, man, look at what God did through me. And he was so rejoicing in that, that the people heard him from far aware, that we would see it like Moses and just, you got to the other side of the Red Sea and you're just like, God, you're awesome. You're just awesome. You did what only you could do in and through my story. And so the, the whole hope behind this discussion today um, is just that, 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 that we would leave here sanctified, understanding worship, maybe in a different light than we've ever seen it um, here today. And, and I couldn't think of anybody better to ask, have this conversation with than you guys. And mainly because I, I know you guys, not just because y'all sing and play music here, but, but I have the unique blessing of of getting to see these folks when the lights aren't here, 
when you ain't here. It's 5.45 in the morning. Um, I see Haley pushing her baby in here early, early in the morning. Um, I, I see Kami putting on the altar her kids and her marriage to come in here and lead you guys in worship. I see a, a desire for, for prayer, just to ask God to show up. Like if y'all, I always say, I wish that I could get like an undercover camera and, and show what goes into to them leading you in song and praise. But like you'd be blown away at, at the time of prayer that has gone into this, uh, the sacrifices that these guys have made. Uh, Morgan drug his, his little girls in here this morning, poor things, they were still trying to wake up. Um, but just the sacrifices that these guys make, and, and they're not paid to do this. Right? They're, they're doing this because they genuinely want to lead you to the throne. They genuinely want you to encounter Jesus. Like this is our heart, this is our prayer every single week, that we don't entertain you, but, but that you would encounter, that you would see just through the crack of the door the glory of God. And, and I'm just so pumped to have this conversation. I can only pray that it's half as good as it was the first service um, we don't rehearse this, all right? So it's just like, hey, here's the questions, pray about it, and let's go have a conversation, all right? If we go a few minutes late, let us go a few minutes late. If you need to leave, always, man, we're always telling you, you can always check out anytime you want, but we can't plan this stuff out. And so, man, I'm just asking for that um, disclaimer, and then just asking the Holy Spirit to move in this moment. Um, but with that said, we've got three questions that we're going to camp out on. Really, one of them is just for Morgan. So really two big questions um, that we're going to go around. And Haley, I'll start with you. Um, but first question is this, how has worship helped you be the weapon that you've needed in a time of desperation and praise? Number two, how has worship been the chainsaw against the tree that's in the road? And then the question that we're going to ask Morgan here in a little bit is for the person who's not musically inclined. So if you're that person right now and you're like, well, this has nothing to do with me because I'll never play guitar. I'll never play the piano. I'm just a, a cow puncher out there. Wait, we got Morgan up here. He's going to speak into that. Like, what does that look like for the guy that doesn't play guitar? What can worship how can I see worship different as a guy that doesn't know anything about music? And so, Haley, we'll start with you. How's worship help you beam the weapon? Uh, well, first, I'm just super excited. I was telling Ryan just a couple of weeks ago, we have been, like, praying so hard as a team just in how we could express to you guys that this is so much more than us singing a song or more than a song service. We have been praying about that for months, and then all of a sudden, Ryan has approached this topic, and I'm just so thankful um, to have this space. But... Before I can really answer that question as far as, like, is it being a weapon to me, I just feel like the Lord all week long, I've battled him. I just want to answer the question, Lord, and he's like, nope, I want you to tell why you're, like, why worship is that and what worship is. And so the easiest way for me to do that, I just remember being in shock and awe one day. I just decided to look up the definition of worship. Um, this is a couple of years into me, the Lord calling me to lead. And so this is straight out of the Webster's Dictionary. You can fact check me when you get home if you have a dictionary still. Um, this uh, is the definition of worship. It says to adore, honor, or show great extravagant respect for. It's an act of expressing admiration, reverence, or devotion to. And what I love about that is nothing in that in that uh, definition says anything about music, says anything about song. And I think song is a great expression of our worship, which and I wish we could camp out on that because that's a there's so many different expressions of worship. But I just want us to wrap our mind around that this is something that we as a church have made it be about is just at this time of just song. But that is just an expression. And I love, I mean, gosh, just singing these songs up here. The, the reason the song is powerful is not because it's words on a screen. The reason it's powerful is because who is written about and these promises and these truths that are in these songs. And that's where the power, that's where the weapon comes from in, you know, calling this time of worship, these songs, um, weapons. And so um, one of my favorite scriptures about uh, worship and what we've kind of just based our worship team around is Romans 12, 1. Um, and it says, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies a holy and living sacrifice acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So even in that, it says nothing about us opening our mouth and singing these songs. It's talking about us living in sacrifice, living and surrendering over our bodies, our minds, our hearts to the Lord. That is our spiritual service, our spiritual act of worship. And so I just think that's so powerful. And another scripture that the Lord um, showed me this week that I thought was so good um, is in Hebrews 12. Um, I've never thought about this in the light of worship, but it's Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. It says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, 
let us show gratitude. Gratitude can be worship. Like, I just want us to open our eyes to, like, just forget about worship as right up here. I just want us to, for the rest of the time, to think about all these different avenues of what worship is. And that's a way that we can worship is just being grateful to the Lord and grateful for the life that we live. And it, and it goes on next to say, it says, by which we may offer to God offering, our offering, our sacrifice, our surrender. That is worship. And then it says next, it says, an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So us serving the Lord, you serving coffee outside, you greeting at the door, like all of these things can be worship. It doesn't just have to look like us singing this song. And what I love about that too is that's just the season of worship that I'm in right now. We talk about it all the time in our Sunday school time is like, what does everybody's private worship look like outside of these four walls? And for me right now, worship is serving my kids, getting in the down and dirty. I just sucked out a nose five minutes before I walked up here on the stage. Like I'm serving my kids. I'm serving my family and moms out there. You are doing that. And the Lord sees that and he honors that. He looks at that as worship, that you are glorifying him through that, through taking care of your kids, through your selfless acts. Like that is worship. And I just think that's so beautiful. Um, and one of the things that I love about uh, worship to one of my favorite sayings, and I think it just brings such a different light to it, is that salvation demonstrates God's love for us, but our worship is what demonstrates our love to him. So anything that shows the Lord that you love him, any thought, any action that brings him glory, that is worship. Um, and so the reason I want to talk about in it in that light is because, and read that even that definition, in that definition, there is nothing about me. There's not one thing in that definition that says anything about Haley, that says anything about what I can get. What It's all about what I can do for the Lord, and it's all about the Lord. Like, I'm not going to honor and adore. It doesn't say honor, adore, show great res extravagant respect for so that you can be seen. It doesn't say anything about that. It's all about the Lord. And I think there's just something so powerful, and that's how it's a weapon for me, is that it literally eliminates me from the equation. Worship eliminates me completely out of the equation and just points and puts the focus back on the Lord um, and just being in awe of the Lord, just sitting in awe and devoting ourselves to him. That's where it's a weapon um, because ultimately the enemy is like out to make us be this selfish creature and he wants us to think all about ourselves and our praise and me getting glory, and me getting honor, and me getting uh, just all these these things for myself. And when when we like when we live in that mindset and we give into that, we're going to self destruct. And that's what the enemy wants. See, like it doesn't even have to do anything. He's already won. Um, he's already got me. Whenever I can give into that, but when we live our life in this surrender, and that's what I love, Ryan's been talking about these stories that you recapped on it this morning of Jehoshaphat and, and Joshua and Nehemiah, and I think that's how worship was their weapon, was that they lived in surrender. They were like, okay, Lord, we don't know what to do. This is kind of our game plan, but what do you want us to do? So they surrendered to the plan and the will of the Lord, and then not only that, but they obeyed. They're like, that really is crazy. I don't think that's going to work. You know, I'm not going to send my worship leaders to the front line or I'm not going to march around this city. That's not going to work. Like they didn't, they might've thought that, but they still obeyed and walked in obedience. And so I think that's where worship is a weapon. Um, and I think also what I love about worship and even through song expression too, um, worship takes the focus off of our situation and it puts the focus on the savior. So that's what's so powerful about it too, is that it just, like I said, it just eliminates us from the equation. Um, and I was thinking about this this week and I went on a tangent a little bit this morning. I'll try to keep it a little bit shorter, but Ryan talked about when we're coming back to this question about it being a weapon, I was thinking weapons are cool. I have been living a life of weapons at my house with my three-year-old son, everything is a weapon. I mean, even like literally a hairpin, a bobby pin the other day, he was pretending it was a gun. He's like, pew, 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 just shooting. So we have swords, we have bow and arrows, we have axes, we have guns, we have all the arsonry of weapons at our house. And so I'm like, that's really cool for offense, 
you know, like weapons are good for offense. Um, but what about defense? And I think Wake even had that um, thought too, just back several weeks ago. He was fighting Callan and it was like all of a sudden he was like, I need a shield. We've been watching Robin Hood. And so they have the shields. And so it's like, I need a shield. And in that moment, I'm like, dang, that's good. Like, I can have a weapon all day long and use it to fight, but if I don't have something to also protect my body with and protect myself with, like, I'm not going to be able to extinguish these fiery darts of the evil one that we talk, it talks about in Ephesians 6, and I want to read that, but I don't want to go too far in, but it just talks about putting on the armor of the Lord, and it's only effective if it's worn. And weapons are only effective if they're used. Like, what, what's the point of showing up to a gunfight and leaving the gun in the holster? Like, there's no point in doing that. It's the same for church. Like, um, and so all that to say, I've been thinking about that all this week of like, what if we just showed up to church and we grabbed our weapons, like we left our body armor and our weapons at the door and we grabbed them as we came in, we put them on, we, you know, flung our swords around and paraded around, but we walk back outside and all the bad guys are out there. The bad guys are out there and they're waiting for us. And we are only like utilizing this gift, this precious thing of worship in this in these four walls but we're not utilizing it out here like the bad guys are going to get us that's what wake he always says the bad guys i'm going to get the bad guys but the bad guys are going to get us they are i mean because the reality is this war is not against flesh and blood it's against the principalities it's against the dark the darkness the evil forces um and so those arrows they're going to come like it doesn't say if i mean it says the fiery darts of the evil one are coming our way. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have a dinged up armor because it's going to happen. Like, I'm still going to get banged up. I'm still going to get scratched. I'm still going to get hurt. We are still going to get hurt in this fight. But I would much rather get hurt with armor on than be totally destroyed by that arrow that just comes and pierces my heart without that shield, without that breastplate of righteousness, without the helmet of salvation, without the gospel of peace on my feet. Like, I would much rather do that. And so I think that is how it's helped me, Ryan, is just remembering that this time of worship, that worship itself, is not a suggestion, that it is literally my lifeline. And I would not have ever survived any of the seasons that I've I've walked through without worship, whether that is song form, whether that is praying, whether that is fasting, whether that is reading my word, whether that is communing with friends that are lifting me up, whatever that looks like, I would not have made it because worship is my power outlet. It connects me to the heart of the Father. That is my connection between me and Him. And not only that, but it's my protection against this really real enemy that's out there. That's good. Good stuff. All right, Kami. Yeah. I said first service, I was like, okay, we can just go home now. That was great. Um, So, oh gosh. Okay, so when Ryan texted me this week saying that he was wanting, felt like the Lord was putting me on his heart for this, he's like, block. Block your number. I ain't doing this. I'll go up there and sing some songs, but I ain't going to be getting up in front of a bunch of people and sharing my junk. So, here I am. <laughs> so um, when Ryan was asking these questions, my first thought was go surface level, surface level. What are songs that I worship, song, form of song, that got me through hard times? Like that's what I was thinking. And then the Lord was like, surface level ain't going to do nothing. So I don't know who, who needs to hear this. Surface level ain't going to get you nowhere. Go deeper. Surface level isn't isn't where it's at. So I'm going deeper. So I had had a couple of songs that specifically, when I think of worship and I think of how the Lord moved in my life, I have a couple of songs. And one of them was Nothing Else. We sing that here. It just talks about being completely broken and not wanting anything. So I was like, it put me in Kansas, which anybody that knows my testimony knows that Kansas was a hard time for me. Um, That was when me and Robert were just married, and Robert was in a different season of life, who's my husband, if y'all don't know. Um, He wasn't leading the way he was called to lead, and I just felt like I was in a desert, not being fed, um, just felt so lost. And so I got to a place where I remember singing nothing else, 
of just in a place of like, God, I need you. God, I, I don't want anything else. I just want you. And then fast forward to when I moved here, um, just a different season of life. And um, it brought up the song, um, Reason to Praise. Wow. Um, reason to Praise. And, and that, w- that put me in, when I was singing that song, me and Robert were singing that over our home. It was just, I was in the thick of depression and and that was kind of our just um, cry to try to get me out of, there's always a reason. I was in a desert and you bring paradise from the deserts. And, and so I was, I was trying to go through of like, those were the surface level answers of like, this song got me through this time. This song got me through this time. And, and the Lord kind of was just like, why? Like, why did those songs get you through there? And it was where I just kind of sat and, and just thought about it. And it was a time of complete surrender, which I think is so crazy. And we, like Ryan said, we didn't plan this, but the things that we talked about for service, we were kind of blown away why we were blown away that the God of the universe can do this. I don't know, but we were kind of blown away. I mean, Haley was talking about surrender and that's exactly what the Lord put on my heart is just the surrender moment. Um, And the verse that, a couple of verses is, the first one is Psalms 51, 16 and 17. And this is coming from David, and this is right after Nathan, his buddy, had came and called him out about an affair and called him out about um, all this stuff with Bathsheba, and this was his cry, and it's 51 and 16 and 17. It says, you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God, and that, I mean, it's just surrender. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to come in here and have it all together. That's not what we're called to do. Um, and then another thing that, so I help with Crossroads and um, we're going over John and the Lord kind of showed me showed me this too, which was just a full surrender moment too as well. And it's um, in John 6 and this is right after Jesus had fed the 5,000 and the next day the people had came back and they were wanting more. They were wanting more miracles. They were wanting more bread. They were wanting to be fed. And Jesus pretty much told them, like, you're here because you want more food. Isn't that a bunch of Christians? We come to church for all of the entertainment. We come to church for all of the miracles. We come because we want a, we want a healing. Maybe it's in our marriage. And those are good things. We're coming to the right person. But are we coming to church to be entertained? When we come to church, are we looking at worship songs being like, mm, that's not my jam. I don't think I'm going to worship to that. Well, good, because it's not, it's not about you. That song is not about you. They're not singing those songs for you. They're singing it for the creator. And so when we take a look at that and we say, hey, worship isn't a time for us to be about us. It's a time for us to have the honor to be able to come before a God that created the stars, that we can stand in awe, that he wants a relationship with you, that we can sit there and be like, man, we get to praise you, and then we get to hear from you, like, man, that's so good, but anyways, so the the people are coming, and they're wanting miracles, and some of them are getting upset, they're getting mad that he's not giving them bread, he's get they're mad because they're not, he's not performing any, any more miracles, and um, Jesus looks to him, and it says, at six, verse 66, it says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you going to leave? No matter your season, no matter what you're facing, no matter the tree that's in your road, the Lord's asking, are you going to leave? Are you going to leave? And I thought it was so cool. The next part of it says, Simon Peter replied, Lord, Lord, to whom would we go? Surrender. We get to a place, and that's what I think is so cool about worship is we get to a place where we're like, it don't matter. It doesn't matter what life throws at us. Where else are we going to go? We can't find hope in anything else. All the things, I think all of the other disciples that left, they were so focused on everything else. They were fo- so so focused on the bread and what God could give that they forgot to keep the main thing the main thing, like Ryan preaches about all the time. We come for Jesus not to be entertained. And so that's 
something that the Lord has shown me through worship is just being able to be in this complete surrender and being able to just bask in his goodness, be in awe of who he is, have that opportunity, that relationship with him. Um, and in return, it's going to have an overflow. Other people are going to see that. And, and that's what we're here for is just to stir others' hearts towards Jesus, you know? So. That's good. That's good. Oh, this one works. You got yes. two mics. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we were just cracking up after the first service that w several of us were in John. And so here's more in John. <laughs> um, if we'll go to John 4, verse 21, I'm going to read this scripture over you and then we'll talk about it. Um, First off, it says, woman, Jesus replied. And I said this at first service, but I just love the relatability there. Like, Jesus is so real and human right here. He's saying, woman, like, look at me, listen to me. Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. So if God is spirit, this is the truth. And this is where I've been um, in my season that I'm in right now of just total awe that we have the freedom and the ability to read this truth every day. Um, and so I think it's so cool that Ryan talked about, you know, how we have really separated work time of worship in the church and time of the word, because it's very clear in this scripture that they are meant to be unified. They're used sure. together. You can't do one without the other because if you have spirit and no truth, you don't have understanding of the spirit. And if you have truth and no spirit, you understand, but there's not a heart connection. And so it's so important for them to be together. It's not a mistake. The churches all over the world have these two things, but it's us that have mistaken them as two separate things. And so I love um, that you focused in on that. And so something uh, that I wanted to say also about the Word of God is that it takes obedience to open this up every single day. It takes making it a priority, and I know, trust me, I know that it is difficult sometimes to be in a season where you're reading this every day, and I know that we laugh at this, but I'm just telling you, like, I'll be the first one to admit that I have definitely done this in several times of my life where I have literally closed my eyes and just opened the word and been like, Lord, I just need something. I just need something to read because I want to know you, God. And I think that's the really the place where we should be coming to read this, not out of just begrudging obedience. Like this obedience comes from this place of recognizing first the Lord of the universe sent his son to die for me. And through this recognition and this awe of this salvation, God, that you've given me, I want to know you. I want to be in relationship with you. That that takes two. It takes us seeking the Lord, and it, it takes the Lord doing what he did through salvation that we're able to seek him and come to him. Um, and so that's just my little that's tidbit. Good. That's real good. Yeah, so uh, it, it was comical in the in the first service. We were none of us talked before this, but um, she spoke on John six and John four, and you can just turn half a page to John five. Um, but in John five, Jesus was going to um, Jerusalem uh, for a festival. He comes to the the pool of Bethesda, and uh, the pool of Bethesda is this uh, this pool where people come to be healed. There's a uh, Excuse me. There's an angel that that comes and anoints these waters, and when he does, he stirs these waters, and it has anointing power, and and uh, whoever gets in the water is healed. So the Bible says in in John five that there's these coverings, um, just to paint a picture of of how many folks are there. It says a multitude of people um, are there to be healed by this water. Um, Jesus comes up to it, and and he sees this guy that's been laying there uh, for thirty eight years, and. Um, 
And this guy, uh, uh, Jesus, walks up to him and he says, do you want to be healed? Um, as if to say, you've been here for 38 years. Why haven't you gotten the water? You know, do you, do you like this? Because if you do, cool. But do you want to be healed? And the guy didn't say, um, yes, I want to be healed. He said, I can't get in the water. This poor guy, he's like, I, people get in front of me and, and, and I just, I can't get into the water. So um, that's the place that I have found myself in time and time again. Um, whenever I come to church, and especially as it pertains to worship, um, in my background and not understanding like why people, why people express themselves in, in, in these strange ways to me at the time, um, and I come up with this, I, I want to be healed, but God, I can't. That guy's wearing his hat in a house of prayer. Um, I want to be healed, God, but, but that guy's wearing shorts or, or the preacher's covered in tattoos and has a beard. And, and I want to be healed, but there's just all these, all these things that don't, don't line up to me. Um, and when I realized um, that I was worshiping um, the God of the universe, the seraphim-wielding, um, galaxy-speaking, ruha breath-breathing God, I realized that he could handle that guy's hat. He could handle that guy's tattoos. He could handle this. And when I realized that I was the guy at the pool of Bethesda, whenever he says, do you want to be healed? Because I come in here to get healed. Hmm. When I, whenever I, I put myself in that guy's position and, uh, and, and see that this guy can, and I believe what the scripture says, only then was I able to pick up my bed and walk. Like the guy at the pool of Bethesda, um, whenever I, I quit focusing on the things around me um, and I focused on who was asking me the question, um, God, I do want to be healed. Yes, I want to be healed. All that other stuff doesn't pertain to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's when I, when I truly understood worship, that, that was uh, how it was able to be a weapon in my life. Well, let me ask you this, because, I, I, man, when I was praying through this panel of who I wanted up here, Morgan was put on my heart because Morgan ultimately, minus the guitar singing part, he represents a large demographic of this church. Just, um, just rough. I mean, just, I mean, just a, a man's man, right? I mean, it's it's easy for me to get up here and oh, you know, just everybody loves Jesus. But like Morgan just represents so many in this church of just like, I mean, some of y'all you aren't even real sure about all this. I mean, we're still kind of even, maybe you're even in a in a weird season of like, it's just weird. We sing weird songs. We talk about honey in the rock and everybody stands up. Preacher preaches to this weird music in the background. Like and maybe you're in that place. And and I asked Morgan specifically this question because as Morgan's friend um, and not his pastor, I've watched him go from that guy to this guy. Um, and it's just been one of the most rewarding things to see this dude just like, like when he's singing I see the evidence that's before me. Like when he's singing that, you can just hear that coming from his heart, right? Um, and so what would you say, Morgan, to the brother or sister that's here today that's like, um, that's completely checked out this conversation because they don't play the guitar, they don't sing, they can't sit at the piano and play Word of God speak. How does, I mean, we're hearing the surrender and obedience, but what does that look like for that, that person that's like, I'll never play music, so what does worship look like for me? What would you say to that? Man, the, whenever, just not very long ago, we'd be riding in the car and, and uh, Kenzie would be playing worship music. I'd turn it off every time. I hate it. It's corny. It's dumb. It repeats itself 27 times. I don't get it. You know, let's listen to something we're listening to. When I took the song out of it and just focused on the words, God, you're good. God, you're good. God, you're good. God, you're good. Yeah. The song don't matter. Um, the song don't matter. Um, we're singing these praises, speaking these truths out. Um, and, and I've been there and, and didn't, didn't understand worship and didn't want to. But it was finding that place, um, putting myself in the scripture, that guy at the pool of Bethesda, being like, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just making excuses. Um, there's resistance from this enemy that's driving me away from surrender. And whenever I could find that place, finding just uh, trotting out in the morning, you know, in a jig line behind 10 guys, just... God, you created all this. I'm worshiping. I'm yeah. worshiping in that moment. That's why I do what I do for a living because it's easy to see the evidence of the Lord. And, and I would just say, find that place. Find a pasture in West Texas where the sun's coming up and you're getting to trot out on a snorty colt and just 
bottle that and pertain it to every part of your life. And then I don't care who you are, how rough and tough you are, or if me and you have gotten a fist fight at Bar C back in the day, you will, you will like the worship songs. Whenever it speaks to your life and, and God um, points your eyes on what we're singing about, you will like yeah. them. I love that. That's such a testimony to Brett Bills. My friend Brett Bills is playing bass up here. Brett Bills came into this church like, I ain't doing this contemporary worship stuff. It is not for me. Um, and just to see his growth in the Lord, he got to that place, and he said he just had this weird thing happen at family night. We were singing Only King Forever, and he's like, oh, gosh, what's happening to my hands? You know, it's just like he just, like, felt this connect to the Lord, and he realized in that moment that it wasn't about the song. I mean, he came from a real hard religious background, and I think that's the damage of so much of this. It is so hard to get under the fact that I, I would say so far to say that the that, that, that music part of it is really the least of what true worship is. I mean, I sat next to that river in, in Colorado, and my phone wasn't connected to anything. It was dead. And I had some of the greatest worship that I've ever had watching the, the leaves flicker on the trees and listening to an eagle that was flying over and to hear the, um, the, the river and, I mean, just seeing the trout swim up the river like, I was worshiping in that moment, and there wasn't a song that was playing. And, and I think that's the great danger is it's so hard if you've, like me, if you've grown up in the church and, and you came here, like, it's hard to reprogram our minds to, to think worship is not always music. I mean, for me, I love music, and I connect through that. But, man, so many times you're right. So many times it is just something else. And then from that place, you just automatically like anything that's glorifying the Lord. I mean, then at that point, you're like, I mean, I can listen to Lecrae or KB and like, I'm not, I don't like rap, but I'm like, that's pretty awesome because he's telling God how awesome that he is. And so it does, it just automatically transfers you into this place of, of seeing it so much more than the song. And so um, that said, uh, quickly, we'll go through this last question um, because it is too good to pass up. Um, but I want just personal um, just vulnerability in this, but how has worship been that chainsaw against the tree in the road? And we've been talking about that. The tree has fallen, practical things that have helped you get through that tree. How has worship been that for you guys? Haley, start with you. Yeah, um, even just thinking about this question for me this week, I mean, I said it during first service. I think I had a, I've had enough trees that have fallen in my path like I could make a log cabin mansion. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just so true. The last 10 years, the Lord has brought Callan and I through some really hard stuff. And, and I know most of you know my story and our story, but if you don't, I don't want to ever skip over just telling you about what happened and telling you about what the Lord has done with what has happened. And so back in 2015, um, Callan and I were youth pastors and Callan had an affair with a girl um, in our youth group. And so ultimately that landed us with the title of sex offender um, on our heads and just all the probation and the rules and everything um, that comes with that. And it just, it really like literally hinders us from operating as a normal family. Um, and then not only that, but so fast forward 2018, um, we had just like witness all the Lord doing all these miracles, all these amazing things. And just right when we got our feet back underneath us, our house burned um, in Anson um, in 2018. And then later that year, um, we had been married for seven years and finally got pregnant. Um, and I had a miscarriage. And so it was just this hit after hit, tree after tree, um, just falling in, on, in our road. And then finally, 2019, I get pregnant with Lively and just this blessing, this tremendous, I'm like, this is a turnaround moment for me. Like, this is a gift from the Lord. And then even with that, just this crazy amount of depression and anxiety um, came with motherhood, the title of motherhood for me, if I'm just being real. And so just these trees just just fall after fall after fall um, in front of me. And I just remember so many times just standing there like everybody else that has a tree that has fallen in, in your path. We just stand there and we stare at it and we're like just all these emotions raging through us, like just frustrated. Um, how could this happen? Maybe it happened because of, I mean, there's a lot of trees that also fell from my own anger, from my own sin, from my own shortcomings. But then a lot of things that happened that I couldn't control. A lot of these trees were just falling in my path that I couldn't control. And so I just remember sitting there and just staring at these at these trees. And now that we've been talking about it, not, I didn't call it a tree at that time, but just all these roadblocks and when Ryan started the series of recalculating and he's talking about these trees falling on the road, I remember like this epiphany moment with me and the Lord of like, 
just sitting and staring at this thing that was in my path. I'm like, I have no idea how I'm going to get around this. I have no idea what life is going to look like after this. And I remember the Lord was just like, stop looking at the dang tree. Like, stop looking at the tree. Look at me. Turn your eyes upon me. Fix your eyes upward. And I just remember, like, looking up. And where used to be a tree, a tree, where used to be my shade, my comfort, it was now falling over and I could see this, like just this amazing, immaculate view in front of me. And even though that tree was something maybe that was really good in my life, it fell and I was able to see something even better on the other side of that tree. And so... I think that's how it's been a chainsaw for me is, and now we're, we're living down at Cassie's and I love it because we're so secluded. It's literally like a, like a circle of trees all around us and I love it. But then at the same time, I, I mean, I think about that I, and I've thought about it just this week, walking around outside and praying, like looking at all these trees and I'm like, all these are trees that I used to have in my life that are laid over. And now when the sun is setting, I can see it. I wouldn't have seen it before with all these trees in the way. And so I just think per, the perspective shift that I've gained, that's been the chainsaw for me. I've just gained such a different perspective, not only on life, but just on who the Lord is. And not. And I didn't speak into this a second ago, and I was kicking myself because we talked about it a little bit at first service, but just the daily discipline of what worship is and how it is a daily discipline. Even for me, I'm a worship pastor. I am so passionate about worship. I am so passionate about the Lord. But... There are a lot of days where I don't open my word or I don't pray or I don't, you know, do all these things that I'm supposed to do. But it's a like we have to. It's a discipline. Like it's like anything else. You're going to work out one time. You're not going to see any result. But the more you do it, the more you make it a part of your life. And this is just what I do. Like this is just who I am. Like I am just created to do this. So I am just going to do this. Like it changes our perspective. And I think that is what has kept me you know, from going under so many times when those trees have fallen is like, I'm like, no, I'm not going to let my perspective be this. I'm going to look up. I'm going to put my, my eyes back on Jesus, back on the author and the perfecter, because I know that he's going to work all things for my good. That's good. It's real good. Um, I'm just going to tell a story. So the, sorry guys, I'm obviously not good at this. So I, Ryan, when Ryan had asked before I blocked his number, I had told, I was like praying through it. I'm like, okay, Lord, like, give me what you want to give me, you know? And I didn't hear anything. So then that night, Owen, my youngest, had woke up. So I went and got in bed with him. And I was like doing what any good godly Christian does. And they pray when you wake up in the middle of the night because you're told that if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's from the Lord and he wants to speak to you. So I'm sitting and going, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? And I hear 2 Corinthians 3.16. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that is. It's probably not even a verse that's not from the Lord. So I'm sitting there, go to sleep. I'm like, I'll talk to you in the morning. He's like, 2 Corinthians 316. And I'm like, I'll talk to you in the morning and then you can give it to me then. So I get in my quiet time the next morning, have my quiet time. And then the Lord is like, second Corinthians 316, <laughs> read it. The God I'm like, voice. yeah, the God voice, <laughs> like Alexa, shut that off. So I, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to read. It. It's probably not even a verse. It's probably something really silly. So I go to second Corinthians 316 and this is what it says. It says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Hello, worship. So I was trying to backtrack of like, okay, what is this veil that he's talking about? So the beginning of this chapter it's talking about how Moses used to have to wear a veil when he came in contact with the glory of the Lord. And he had to wear this veil because if people see it, they would fall dead, as Haley said for a service, just fall dead. So he has to cover it, okay? And it was already dimming. That's what it says. It said that even though it was already dimming, he still had to wear the veil. So it talks about how when the veil was over his face, people's 
people's heart was getting hardened to the glory of the Lord. And I think it's so cool that you talked about that because that's something that if we miss it, it's detrimental. We don't see just how powerful God is. If we don't look out and see that his glory is among all the earth, among all the earth, he doesn't, there's no distance. There's not a distance between us and his glory. It's all over the place. It's each person you come in contact with that is created from, that person is created by the Lord. So anyways, so it's talking about this veil and it's talking about whenever it's taken off of our face, we can see the glory of the Lord and there's freedom from that. And so I go back to, I told, said for a service, the vulnerability with that. I was on the way up here, me and my husband had gotten this knockout drag out fight last night, just being real honest. And so I'm sitting here like, okay, Lord's like, okay, let's deal with this. And I'm like, no, it's fine. God, I'll just say what you, you have exactly, you showed me this 2 Corinthians 3.16, like, it's fine. I'll just, and he's like, no, like, we're pulling it all out. Like, we're pulling it all out. We're being completely vulnerable, and we're emptying all this out. And so, in, in the vulnerability, we see just the glory of the Lord, and we get to experience the glory of the Lord, and that veil's taken off. And that's something that I've been in prayer for, and then I told the worship team this morning that that is something that when the Lord gave me that, like, as a church, as a congregation, that our veil will be taken off and that we will see the glory of the Lord and we will just stand in awe and we'll experience freedom because that's what happens with our testimonies. That's what happens whenever we're able to be vulnerable and we're emptying out everything we have during the worships, the worship songs, during the message, during invitation, during your, when you're in the mountains, whenever you're driving in a car with screaming kids in the back, whether it's Anything you're doing, when you're able to empty that out completely and just be vulnerable with the Lord, we're able to experience freedom, which isn't it just like God. Mm-hmm. Moments that are mess, and we don't want to do it, and it's comfortable. Like you said, with that tree, it's comfortable to stay underneath that tree, that tree and that shade. But whenever we step out and we're vulnerable in that, the Lord's going to bless that, and he's going to say, hey, thank you for walking in obedience. Thank you for walking in obedience. So vulnerability. it's kind of crazy that the Lord asked us to talk about vulnerability, but he also asks us to do it. Um, So I'm so grateful, first of all, just for a team and a body um, that displays this so well. And I hope um, that we'll keep on doing that because it's so good for other people, too. It's so infectious. Vulnerability is an act of worship to the Father, but it's also an act of service to each other. Um, so, two years ago, um, we were going through, Cole and I, my husband, were going through some uh, issues in our marriage, and I just ran away. Like, I, I literally just checked out of my life, my responsibilities, everything, my friends, my family, and I just ran away, and I went, and I was doing a travel nurse contract to make some money, but really, I, I just ran away. Um, And while I was there, um, I just found myself in the middle of an affair. And I remember that night, like I had said, I would never, my whole relationship with my husband, I've known him since high school, I've said I would never. And I just found myself that night before the Lord asking him, how could I ever do this? How could I have ever done this? And how could you ever love me and receive me again? And thankfully, praise God, I was in the season of obedience to the word. And that doesn't promise you that sin isn't going to come. And if there's anything I want you to hear, I want you to hear that. Worship does not promise that sin will not be there. Worship just promises that you will be able to find God in the middle of it. And so I had opened up my word that night after all of that had happened. I was just on my face before God, and it was time to read my word again. And even in the middle of my sin, I was like, I know I need to do this. So I open up, and I'm in Jonah, which I don't know if you know the story of Jonah, but just was exactly what I was going through. (laughs) 
I don't know why we're ever surprised by that, but I opened to Jonah too, and I just want to read this prayer over you. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath me barred in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. So, just literally coming before the Lord in the middle of my sin, seeking his truth, and being able to come before him in this place of, God, I know, even in my darkest sin, God, I know I am still worthy of the salvation that you've gifted me, God. And from there, I will do anything. I will do anything. I will speak to whoever you want. I will give my time and my service in whatever way you ask. I will do something super scary like this, having to share all my junk to the people that I don't know. God, I will do anything because I love you, because I'm in awe of you, because I adore you, God. This place, this altar of salvation is the place that I truly can do anything from, and so can you. Like, the strength of the Lord goes before you, but it's just this daily reminder now for me. Praise the Lord. We are two years after that. We are now praising with shouts of joy. My husband and I have just have been redeemed in this season, and it's so good. And my joy really does come from that place of redemption, but... I just realize now like the importance of this as a weapon and how my daily obedience to it is my worship. And in that, I really can. We can overcome any tree that comes in our sight. So, so good. So good. A little weepy. <laughs> that, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for us. Like we this uh, connection that we've created as this worship team and just everybody that's kind of a core of this church is, has like really brought the, the old silly term kindred spirit to life, you know, that, our, that we're able to battle with each other and, and, uh, and commune in that, in that way, and it's beautiful. It's, um, but anyway, that has nothing to do with this. Um, in my life, I've come to the realization that knowing, uh, knowing and believing is very different um, than feeling and experiencing. Um, for example, and, and I'm reading this because I, I don't want y'all to hear what I'm not saying. Um, I, I, want, I want y'all to hear, hear my heart behind this. We have to read the Bible um, to know what God says about us and to learn his character. We have to. There's no other way we can do it. Um, but we cannot ignore the Zephaniah 314 song that he wants to sing over our life and the relationship that he wants with us when our Bibles are closed. We can't let God die whenever we whenever we're not in our word. That's good. He wants a relationship with us. Um this picture right here on the screen was uh was a moment for me that was like pivotal in my understanding of worship. And I told them earlier, it's kind of funny because I was singing the same song um, that I sang this morning, Evidence. And it looks like I was wearing the same hat and the same shirt and probably the same pants. Um, But anyway, that was at a night of worship. And and down at the very bottom, you can see the back of Daily Poe's head. And then my daughter right there, you can see her face, Letty Jo. And uh, 
So I'm singing this song, Evidence, and it's just a song to me at the time. And, and I'm looking at um, Daly and, and uh, Lacey and Letty and Lively, and they're all in the center of us. We, we're set up in the center of this room right here just singing praises to the Lord. And these little kids are in the middle, and they're just engulfed in worship. Um, and like my daughter right there, her hands lifted up towards heaven. And I told the first service, like, we're not hand raisers. Like, we didn't teach her to do that. We don't do that. And, uh, and she's just, she's just, her eyes are closed. Nothing's going on around her except she's holding hands with, with her creator. Um, and in that, in this picture, you can't really tell, thankfully, but I'm bawling my eyes out at just what I'm witnessing, singing about this evidence that I'm getting to experience. Um, and, and it was in that moment, watching those little girls with their hands reach to heaven, that God was holding me in his arms, Jesus wiping my tears away, and the Holy Spirit whispering in my ear, you're welcome. It, it crashed me. I mean, just completely wrecked me. Um, we need hymns. Um, I was raised in, in a traditional church singing hymns, and we need hymns. And those are promises that we stand right. on, that we believe in, just like the Word of God. We read it because we, we believe um, He's going to do what He says He's going to do. Um, but hymns like standing on the promises remind us of His promises. Right. But God gives us, not owing us anything. He loves us enough to give us the affirmation of experiencing His goodness today. If we allow him to. So that was a, a chainsaw. This was a chainsaw um, yeah. in my story. Yeah. And it's just been the coolest thing to to watch that again in, in Morgan just play out. And I don't know, just I'm, I'm just so thankful. I mean, just from a pastor's heart, um, you, you know, it, it's easy to come up here. I say this all the time that it can seem it can seem meaningless some days of just like nobody's listening to nothing. And. And I'm just going to tell you from that place of being vulnerable enough to just say what you said, um, it encourages my heart because the reality is there's a bunch of those trees out here. And, and what you just ultimately did was shine a light on the reality that, that God still loves us despite all of our failures and despite all the trees that fall on our road. Um, I believe that there's a healing coming from you being vulnerable in that. And, and I can't thank you enough because that's us. I mean, this is why we plaster it everywhere. We want you to be able to come in here as you are and, and know that God will meet you right where you're at. And, and I'm just so thankful for the vulnerability for all of y'all that we haven't created an environment where we're in here just like, we got all of our crap together and everything's great. And, but that we can come up here and go, I've, I fought with my husband on the way out of the church. Um, which side note, that's why you sleep in a camper on Saturday nights. That's why I do that. Um, <laughs> But that we've just created a, a space to go, look, I, I'm not up here trying to be someone that I'm not. And, and I can say that about everyone that stands on the stage. And, the, and, and Hannah, I'll just say this. I'm so thankful that you are investing in my daughter um, because that's the kind of stuff I want my daughter to hear. I want, just, I want real life. And that's what we've tried to create in this church. And it makes me so thankful um, to not only see that going on out here, but to see the very people that are in these roles of leading worship to go, hey, look, this is why it's so important to me because I've lived through it. I've been in the dark night of my soul um, and all I had was opening my word and worshiping him in that moment. And so just so thankful uh, for you guys. Can we give these guys a big hand? <clears throat> so, so thankful. Um, here's how we're going to end this service. I never want to, to not give an invitation um, for those that have never put their trust and faith in Jesus. Here's the re reality of every story that's on this stage. We can stand in this place because we have the Holy Spirit in us, right? We have the Holy Spirit in us because we have given our life and we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. We have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And because of that, we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus... It is that simple. Um, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that who would ever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10 says that all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. I'm going to tell you the greatest decision you'll, that you'll ever make in your life is that gift of salvation. Um, Hannah's right. Sometimes that's, that's all we have in those moments that the tree falls upon the road to go, look, I may lose everything in my life, but I know I still got Jesus. Um, and if you never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come down front. There's gonna be some men and women that wanna have a prayer, have a conversation with you. Um,
but we want to give you that invitation no matter what we're doing here on the stage. In fact, I've asked uh, Morgan to help me in this. We're going to have two prayers here at the end. And I've asked Morgan to just pray for you. If you would be here today and your story is I've never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, I've just asked Morgan to pray over you, that we'd pray for the lost, that the lost would be saved today. So Morgan, would you mind um, praying for that lost soul that might be here today? God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this uh, this team, these people, these uh, just this this body of believers that I get to um, experience life with and grow with and learn from. Um, Lord, I just um, I just want to pray specifically for the lost in here. Um, if that person's guarded, um, be it um, the distractions that I spoke out about earlier, um, or or just. Uh, anything, whatever's holding them up, Lord, um, please help them see a glimmer of hope um, that I hope that we will always portray. Um, the, the life change that has happened in us um, that points to you, Lord, um, is something that we can never we can never write out on paper is the the uh, resistance from the enemy um, in the salvation process. And, and Lord, I just pray that that be revealed, um, that, that, that we can combat um, whatever is standing in our way. Um, that, that hinders a relationship with you, Lord. So um, for the lost one in here, Lord, um, please just prick their heart. Yeah. Um, guide them um, to, to making steps towards uh, a future. Yeah. Um, forgive us for where we fail you. Thank you for forgiving us. Um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. And then for everyone else that's here today, your story is, you know, you've put your trust and faith in Jesus. And maybe today is just a step towards understanding worship in a different context. Um, maybe at the altar this morning, you need to, you need to put some obedience. Um, maybe like all of us, we do. We get so busy with our time and with priorities. Um, we, we can't remember the last time that, that we've made the Lord a priority in our story. And, and so maybe there needs to be some repentance. Um, but maybe there needs to be some surrender. Um, I'm a fool to think that, that Hannah is the only one that's got the courage to come up here and go, this has been my story. And I'm giving everything to you, God. Um, maybe some things, some sin needs to be laid on the altar um, as we worship him, him this morning. To just get to this place open-handed. Um, to, to go, God, I'll, anything, I'll do anything, as Hannah said. I'll do anything. Um, and maybe that needs to happen in someone's story today. Um, we just want this time of worship, again, to be more than just a song. But it would be a moment in our story as born-again believers um, to be able to find ourselves seeing worship maybe in a different context. We'd spend time seeking the Lord, asking the Lord to reveal our hearts to us and laying that stuff down before him and that we'd leave here a little different than when we got here this morning. But we're going to pray and we're going to sing and we're going to see what the Lord's up to in this moment. Father, we love you so much and I thank you for who you are. Um, God, I thank you for the blessing of worship. Lord, I thank you for the song um, that you do sing over us in Zephaniah 3, that you tell us that, Lord. And I'm so, so thankful um, for that, Lord. I, I personally want to hear that song all the days of my life. I, I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night wanting to hear that song that you're singing over us, Lord. And I just pray that in a supernatural Holy Spirit way, we would hear that song over us um, today, Lord. More than a melody, more than a tune, more than a genre. God, that we would hear the spirit of the living God singing over us here today, Father. That you would sing into our hearts. That you would sing into our weariness, God. That you would sing into our sin, Lord. That you would expose hearts. God, that we would see this so much more than the songs that we sing, Lord. And God, on behalf of the church, I just, I repent of what we so often make things in the church. It's so out of the lane and where you designed it to be, Father. And so, Father, we repent of that and we turn to you and we fix our eyes on you. And we pray that, that as we worship you, Lord, more than reading words on a screen, God, that you would speak to us. So, Holy Spirit, we're asking you to come in this moment. Every soul, every person that sits in the seats of this building, Lord, we know that every story is different, yet we're all the same, Lord. We need a word from you, Father. And so I pray that you would speak to us as we worship you. God, as our hands are before you, wide open, whatever you have for us, Holy Spirit, would you come? Holy Spirit, would you do what only you can do, Father? We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name.